Welcome back to the Exponential Athlete Podcast. This is part two of the three-part series on Kobe Bryant, the anatomy of excellence. In this part, we're going to focus on Kobe's mentality and his philosophy towards greatness. In part one, we focused on how he approached learning and his view on that. So in this part, we're going to touch on a couple different areas. So first is his adaptability. Second is his long-term thinking. Third, we're going to touch on how he views confidence and how he accumulated that confidence over time. We also talk about his view on challenging and creating challenges for himself, his hero mentality, how he views himself as a hero in his own narrative. And then finally, we're going to touch on the mama mentality, which is talked about quite a bit in the media, in any podcast you listen to. But when I was listening to him describe it, it felt like it was a little bit vague. It was a little bit amorphous. So today, when we get to that mama mentality section, I'm going to try to really make it a bit more concrete about what that construct is and how he leveraged that in his play. I think that the mama mentality is fascinating, but I think he was holding something a little bit back and we're going to dive in to, to really parse out specifically what that is and what that did for him. Now, jumping in to the episode here, I wanted to start with another quote. So this quote to me, it well, I'm, I'm just going to read it. That's probably the best way to do it. Let me find it here. He worked harder than any other kid I've seen ever. Pro, college, high school, whatever. He was probably the hardest working basketball player ever. He wanted it. He wanted it more than anyone. So I, I wouldn't go as far as saying this quote is BS, but I think it's a massive simplification of Kobe Bryant's greatness. If you attribute all of his success just to hard work, that's not giving credit for how intelligent he was about his process, how his mindset really allowed him to do all the hard work, how he built up his confidence through a lot of this hard work, how he was able to have a long career, even though he put in so many hours that broke down his body. So this section is going to be drilling into what are the building blocks that made that hard work possible and how did he do that hard work intelligently to make him great? Again, anyone can work really hard, but I think it's the fact that Kobe did a lot of this hard work in an intelligent way, and he also did more of it, is what made him so great compared to his peers. So the first area I want to touch on uh, is, in this section, it's called Mr. Adaptable. So yes, Kobe Bryant worked really hard, but he suffered a lot of injuries. He was able to recover in time periods and timetables that were unbelievable for, for what the doctors and some of these other people were seeing. And there's a reason for that. It's because he was very receptive to his body. He listened to his body and he was able to give it what it needed to recover or the rest it needed when he was pushing himself really hard. He says that his adaptability goes all the way back to when he was growing up in Italy. So when he was in Italy as a kid, he went there, I think it was at eight years old and he didn't speak the language. He had to go and everywhere he went, he had to learn how to communicate. He had to learn to make new friends because his dad was traveling all over Italy in different regions playing basketball. So he was constantly in these new scenarios and he had to quickly adapt, whether it was language, whether it was making friends, whether it was making any of these things. And to be honest, basketball was one of the same, the only constants throughout all of that. So basketball is an area that he, he also still was able to grow and adapt in in just a different way. I like this idea, and I think it's a misconception that Kobe never slept. So he would work out really early in the morning at 4.30. He would do night workouts at night, and it seemed to everyone else like he was never getting sleep. He would say that he was getting four hours of sleep a night, which was accurate. But at the same time, what a lot of people don't know is that Kobe was a prolific napper. Here's a really good quote associated uh, with that. Sometimes I'd be so tired I need a quick nap at some point during the day, whether before practice or a finals game on the bus or the trainer's table five hours before tip off or 60 minutes. If I was tired, I would doze off. So yes, he's not getting as much sleep as maybe some of the other players at night, but he's filling in the gaps when he has time. He's using his schedule as efficiently as possible and he's listening to his body as he goes. So rather than saying, oh, you know, I have to sacrifice sleep, which I don't think any doctor, sports physiologist, anyone in this 
day and age would recommend, he was still getting those hours in, just not in the conventional way, sleeping eight hours at, at a night or something along those lines. So that to me was a sort of light bulb moment is, you know, Kobe saying one thing and his actions show another thing where he was very intentional about this. I mean, Kobe Bryant wasn't, he probably would have been better off if he slept eight hours a night, right? But he was still getting these hours in when people thought he wasn't. And that maybe was a mental game he was playing as well. There's this common theme of Kobe Bryant really giving his body and his mind what it needed to perform. And this gets wrapped up, this gets overlooked if you're only focusing on how hard he works. This was also very interesting to me. So rather than having a specific routine, he sort of adjusted his routine to what he needed that day. So he said, I never had a set routine, an ironclad formula that I practiced night after night. I listened to my body and let it inform my warm up because there are always variables. If I felt I needed to shoot extra jumpers, I'd shoot more. If I felt I needed to meditate, I'd meditate. If I felt the need to stretch for longer durations, I'd stretch. And if I felt the need to rest, I'd sleep. I always listen to my body. That was the best advice I can give. Listen to your body and warm up with purpose. So we talked about introspection in the first part and how that was a big part of his learning. Introspection is a really big part of his recovery and his injury prevention and his performance. And to me, that's a, a, something you don't see from everyone. A lot of people, they just go through a routine. Oh, I, I'm working on this. I do this before every single game. I shoot the same shots from the same spot. No, he was very intentional. It was customized to what he needed, but what wasn't customized or mutable was that he was going to practice for a certain amount of time. So something that he said he got from his mom is that practice or structure, so it was more structure, is what enables creativity, which I thought was really interesting. You usually think of those two things as oppositional forces. But what he's saying is, hey, if I am forcing myself to practice for three hours, I have to be really creative in those three hours to make it fun for myself. I have to try a bunch of things. I have to be able to entertain myself the whole time while I'm practicing. And that's where that creativity comes in. And so if you're setting structure like that, like, yes, I have to recover. I have to warm up. I have to do these things. But what I do within that construct of recovery or preparation can be adjustable or mutable. That's maybe a different philosophy that could benefit us all. He also had the same approach to mental preparation. My mental preparation varied based on my headspace. It varied based on where I thought my head needed to be for a specific game. If I needed to get keyed up, for example, I'd listen to hard music. If I needed to soothe myself, I might play the same soundtrack I listened to on the bus in high school to put me back in that place. The key though is being aware of how you're feeling and how you need to be feeling. It starts with awareness. How do we need to be feeling is a really interesting one. In a championship game, do you want to be really amped up for that? Or do you want to be sort of toned down and aware of the moment and, and part of the moment? And I think that that really depends on what your goals are for that moment. But that would be something really interesting to ask your peers, because it's probably different depending on the sport you're playing. For In golf, for example... I would love to ask Tiger Woods, I'd love to ask Phil Mickelson, do you want to be amped off on that first tee shot in the Ryder Cup or in a major? Or do you want to be relaxed and calm? And it might be different for different people. But you also should be aware of how you perform when you're amped up or perform when you're more in a calm state. So that's a lot of introspection that you have to build into understanding how to get yourself in the right frame of mind or frame of body for your performance. Kobe would also adapt based on his injuries. This to me was really cool. So in the last episode, we talked about how he injured his hand in playing basketball in a pickup game in Venice Beach before even his first NBA game started. So he got drafted. He injured his hand in Venice Beach. He had to miss a lot of the preseason. And one of his teammates, I think it was Derek Fisher also, he was saying that he saw Kobe at one of the college gyms and he did a full basketball workout with a broken hand, but he did it like he was a left-handed player. He took every shot left-handed. He went through the full practice routine that he normally would do just left-handed. And Kobe was very strong with his left hand. I think Shane Battier might say that he wasn't quite as strong with his left hand or going, going left, but he still was a lot better than a lot of other players. This is something you could clear he you could tell he actively worked on. And sometimes injury allows us to 
work on things that we wouldn't have time for or that we wouldn't be optimizing for if we just had an open open schedule or we were or we were healthy. You know, for example, I injured my knee and again, I'm not comparing myself to to Kobe Bryant, but I injured my knee, I, I tore some ligaments in it and I really couldn't practice jujitsu uh, or do a lot of the moves that I normally do and I ended up working on a game that I could play where I didn't really need my right leg and now that's one of the strongest parts of my game. And so I was able to build that in, probably not a technique I would have ever done without a leg injury, but now it's it's a part of my game that I use regularly and it's quite frustrating for other people. <laughs> he also was able to adjust his game, not just you know playing left-handed, but on the court as he got older and he had more injuries. So when his ankles were hurting him later in his career, he was starting to lose his athleticism. He started really working on his passing. He would have games where he didn't really shoot at all during an entire quarter and just work on his passing. And it helped the team as well in some sense where he was a facilitator and he could take on this other role. You also saw this a lot later in his career when, you know, so in, in the early stage of his career, when he was playing with Shaq, he, he, Kobe didn't use his post-up game at all, but he was actually a very good post player. Later in his career, when Shaq was not there, Kobe was able to start using the post play again and that suited his body a little bit better because it wasn't necessarily as athletic or dynamic a movement. And so he was able to bring that back and adapt to start playing that again, which one helped because his athleticism was waning, but two helped because he had already developed that skill and could work on it. So I, I really like that. And then the final one is very late in his career. So he said, I had to change my shooting form. After I injured my right index finger in the 2009-2010 season, I knew my usual methods would no longer work. Up until then, I'd always shot off my first two fingers. After I hurt it, I had to start focusing on using my middle finger. The middle finger became my point of release, and I sort of let the index finger just drift. So that's a pretty big change for any basketball player, to change your shooting form. He did that even late in his career and was able to adapt to that. But he knew he had to. He was able to work on it diligently. And I'm sure that he built that into his routine and any of these types of things because that's what he was working on. Uh, the, the last example was at the very end of his career when Phil Jackson would try to pull him out of games. He would essentially wave him off and say, if I sat down, my back would freeze up and I couldn't go back in. So he knew his body well enough that essentially <laughs> he knew that he, he would be useless to the team if he came out at a certain time. And so he'd have to stay. And then maybe he was just jesting because he wanted to play more and he just needed a reason to wave Phil Jackson off. But to me, that was a really interesting thing. H how many players would view it like that? They'd say, oh, I'm tired. I, I need to come out and screw my back. But he was thinking over the course of the game in the long run. So I'll end this section by saying, how would you become more adaptable? You know, what are the, the types of things that if you're injured, you could work on or if, you know, or also when you're approaching a game or approaching an event, what type of mindset should you have and what type of mindset are you going in with? How do you cultivate the specific mindset or state that you'd like to? To me, the best way to do that is ask any of the greatest people you know around that around that domain, what their mindset is like in these pressure situations, or when you're first getting on the field or the court or whatever it might be. That was something that was a big eye opener to me. <clears throat> so this next part is called Kobe, the strategist. So Kobe was not just thinking about the first game. He was thinking many steps ahead. We talk about people playing chess versus playing checkers. Kobe was definitely playing chess. He was thinking three, four or five moves ahead, even as a kid. In the, in the last section, I read the same quote, but I want to read it again. As an adult, Kobe would explain away his behavior by saying that once he turned 13, he was playing the longer game because my game wasn't about being better than you at 13. It was about being better than you when the chips were really on the line. So he's thinking all the way in the future at 13, what skills are going to make him successful in the NBA? What types of things can he learn to be a successful a professional athlete? So it's not just NBA skills, but it's media training, all these types of things. He's doing all of that in high school because he saw the value of it. I wouldn't say he was completely beloved by the media all the time, but it definitely at least paid off late in his career. I would also say that if you look at his post NBA career, his storytelling, his, his winning an Oscar and these types of things, 
that was in the making while he was in the NBA. He was reading storytelling books. He was fascinated with this when he was just in the league. It, it, it was all through his career in the NBA, the 20 years that he was there, he was still learning, reading, writing poetry and doing all this stuff. So it's not surprising that he won an Oscar because he was prepared, he was doing this all along. Even as a kid though, he was focused on injury prevention, which I think we can all do better about. When I was in high school, I was not worried about getting injured. I would bounce back, my body would heal. When he was in high school, after every game, even if he wasn't hurt, he was icing all of his joints because he was thinking about the longer term. He also was very diet conscious. So I don't know if nutritionists would necessarily agree with this, but he would drink all the milk from his teammates at lunch during high school. He would just hoard it because he thought that was best for his body and he wouldn't really eat a lot of junk food. He would really uh, scorn a lot of those things. In high school, he even viewed winning as something that could be prepared for in the long run. So he said a state championship could be planned, could be prepared for, could be one he believed if he and his teammates did everything as it ought to be done if no one deviated, if everyone locked in on the now. So this is his approach to everything. And it frankly would have probably worked better in an individual sport. But Kobe thought that if everyone played their role, if everyone did what they were supposed to do, if you put in the hard work, the return would come. And how you put in the hard work and if everyone played their role, that makes it a lot easier to have that success. As he got to the NBA, I think that this is something that he really struggled with because a lot of the players weren't on the same page. A lot of the players that he played with, winning wasn't their number one priority. They were just happy to be there. They were happy to have the money. They were happy to have all these things. If you have that unifying goal for everyone else, then it can fall together a lot easier. Or if you're that domineering figure that he was in his last two championships where he ran the team and could tell everyone what to do, then that becomes a reality again. But when you have competing personalities or things along those lines, it becomes a lot harder. Uh, at, you know, outside of his high school basketball, when he first got into the NBA, we see a common theory, uh, theme here. He says, the main thing is getting in shape. From what I hear, it's a very long season, a lot of basketball to be played, a lot of bumping and grinding. I have to prepare myself physically so I get into shape and my legs don't get tired. A lot of rookies nowadays tend to hit a wall in the middle of the season. A lot of the great players of the past, Magic, Michael, I don't think they ever hit that wall. I don't want to hit that wall. If I work as hard as I possibly can this summer and I still hit a wall, then I'm going to have to work even harder. So Kobe, there's no mysticism. There's no, oh, I made the NBA. I'm happy. I can just coast. He wants to, in his rookie season, observe all of the errors that the rookies had and not have them. He's basically thinking ahead to figure out what he will encounter, and he's creating a game plan to avoid that as well. Even on the plane, when he's later in his NBA career, there's a story where Matt Barnes is going over to Kobe. He's like, hey, what are you doing, Kobe? And Kobe has just essentially like 300 little courts drawn out. And he's looking at all the, the plays they've run. And he's evaluating where all the defenders were. And Kobe isn't just looking at the first defender or the second defender. He's looking where the third defender is because he knows he's going he's gonna to be double or triple teamed. So if he knows where all these defenders are, he knows what players are open. He also knows... Sorry, he also knows how to uh, avoid those defenders so he can go to the, the basket to score. So again, it's not just he's looking where the first guy or the second guy is. He's thinking in the third or fourth order of who's going to be the next person to guard me and who does that leave open. And then finally, I, I touched on this in the last section, but knowing the refs was a big factor of strategy for Kobe. So he knew everything about the refs. He knew about their families. He knew about the entire rule book. He read the ref handbook. And this meant that he held them accountable, but it also meant that he knew the rules as well as they did and would call them on their, on their stuff. And so he had this incredible advantage of getting all these calls because the refs were genuinely probably scared of him uh, and intimidated by him because he had such an extensive knowledge of their work. While Kobe did have this long-term thinking, he still was fairly impatient, but he was willing to wait to delay gratification. So we talked in part one about how Kobe had these goals and he wanted to get in the NBA quickly. He wanted to have a get married quickly. He wanted to have a family quickly. But on the basketball court, you can't necessarily force some of these things. So when he was forced to wait, he still was observing and patient and learning during that process. 
So when he was growing up, for example, he, yeah, he was a tall kid when he was 13 or 14, but he was goofy. He was uncoordinated. He was lanky. He didn't have the physical presence to be able to dominate the game like he, like he did later in his career. And he realized that. So as he's learning, he's developing moves that will help him once he grows into his body. And then he eventually grew into his body and could start dominating kids in high school. So that patience of, of realizing that things have to come to you sometimes was also there. He probably didn't like it, but he, he did uh, still have that attribute. It wasn't just the athleticism. The mid-range game just became unbelievable. His off the dribble pull-up game. He was shooting over people now. He was stronger, more athletic. So we went from this lanky kid that could only shoot and dunk the ball now to a kid that can score against anybody. That's the story of his progression. So he could shoot and he could dunk, he could get inside, but there were other areas of his game that he just physically wasn't capable of performing. And then once that physicality comes in, he can eventually get in. So as he started his NBA career, he also wasn't playing all the time. And he wanted to play. Don't get me wrong. He was telling all the coaching staff, get me out there. But at the same time, he realized that if he wasn't going to play and that's not something I had control over, he could be patient and he could learn from that. So here's an example of this. His lower Marion crew hungrily watched each game on TV and found it odd to see Bryant sitting there. I'm just taking it in as a learning experience, sitting back and getting to watch the guys, he said. You see so much sitting on the bench, even though you're sweating and saying, man, I want to be out there. You just have to be patient and learn. So this is not something he had control over. You know, he he probably go to Jerry West or or the owners or something like that and say, hey, get me in the game or else. But he still had the ability to look at this objectively as this is something I can control. This is something I can't control. I'm going to wait and learn and be patient uh, as much as I can. Uh, th the last part I thought was interesting was how later in his career, he, um, you know, after Shaq left, they sort of had a, 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 a dearth of capable big men on the team. And that, to me, from the outside looking in, looked like a, a major missing piece for the puzzle. But Kobe, during the time that Shaq left, uh, all the way to when they won their first championship without Shaq, he still was able to put in structure in place that allowed for a big man to come in and really help the team. And that's what happened when Pau Gasol uh, was, was traded for and was put on the Lakers team. So Kobe and Pau got along really well, but it was just timing to set up for when that final piece came in that they could really have a ton of success there. So timing and setting the stage for success when another piece that's necessary comes in, I believe is very, very important. So we've talked a little bit about this before as well, but part of planning for the future is looking internally and being self-aware. That was a part of adaptability. That was a part of a lot of things. And it's a common theme through Kobe Bryant's life. He was very introspective. On the other hand, I think his approach to introspection is a little bit different than other people's. How he creates this introspect introspection is very clear from a lot of the things we're reading. And I'm going to touch on a couple different ways that he becomes more introspective and learns about himself. So it starts probably earlier than this with writing poetry as a kid and, and, and learning. But this is a, a example that he was using in high school. We did a lot of writing in 10th grade. Mastriano recalled in 2015, a lot of free writes, a lot of writers, notebook free writes, just getting the words out, the good words and the bad words too. The writing work meant much to Griffin, who was Kobe Bryant's teammate in terms of assessing his early experiences in Far Rock, just as it helped Bryant with his own young life, so much so that in 2015, he would look back and describe Mastriano as his muse. So in high school, Kobe is journaling, he's writing, pretty much all the stuff that he was writing in this free writing class or in the creative writing class that Mastriano took was about basketball and his relationship with it. And, you know, Kobe was also doing this through rap music. He was doing it through freestyling. He was able to express himself through words and understand his feeling through words, which is a very powerful tool. Someone who will study in a future episode is Serena Williams. She attributes journaling and writing down her experiences related to tennis as one of the things that w helped her achieve the un unbelievably high level in that sport that she did. <clears throat> Kobe's upbringing also gave him a lot of exposure and experience. I've heard a lot of people say, I don't have the maturity yet for the NBA, Brian told Sean Powell. 
Well, I've seen things in my lifetime that ordinary kids haven't seen or experienced. I've been all through Europe, to France, to Germany. I've lived in Italy, been around professional players my whole life. Growing up that way I have, I think I matured faster than an ordinary kid. So we don't just get self-awareness through writing in a journal or thinking. We can also get self-awareness through life experience, trying different things, exploring, going through these different experience sets. And that's something Kobe had in spades. That's something we could probably manufacture. We can't have it necessarily given it given to us like Kobe did through through his life by his parents. But that is something that we can definitely keep in mind. And part of that is that he was really aware of his shortcomings. And in the NBA, this was really fostered by the team psychologist, George Mumford. So there's quite a lot of written about George Mumford, who was the uh, he, he was the sports psychologist under Phil Jackson for the last three-peat of the Chicago Bulls with Michael Jordan and the five championships that the Lakers won under Phil Jackson with Kobe Bryant as well. And George Mumford is really interesting because he brings a mindfulness, uh, zen approach to a lot of introspection. I read his book. It's it's quite good. I'll leave it in the description. I'm also going to hopefully try to get him on the podcast to talk a little bit about more about his approach as well as and how elite athletes use mindfulness to really separate themselves from their peers. But, you know, Kobe, he, you know, it's right here. He welcomed mindfulness sessions because they offered specific mental training, much of it in the Zen mold for reducing the stress of playoffs off competition. When the pressure hit the high side, he's our secret weapon, uh, Kobe would say. I mean, Kobe and Shaq would say about Mumford. Kobe would also say it was good because it gave people a chance to talk about things that might be on their mind, the hype, the pressure. I think it's good for them to talk about those things. It increased our performance a lot. It really has. I'm surprised other teams don't do that kind of stuff. Working with George helps us to get issues out of the way before they even start. Again, mindfulness is a part of Kobe Bryant's story and Michael Jordan's story that really helped them in their careers. There's also very concrete steps to being more mindful with meditation, with awareness, with breathing, with going outside and walking. And I think that that's something we can all integrate relatively easy to help with our self-awareness as well as our performance and getting more into a flow or a Zen state. The next section that we focus on is called confidence versus arrogance. So over the course of Kobe's career, there are so many times when people say he was the most confident person they've ever met at such a young age. And there's so many times where people thought that he was overconfident or that he was arrogant. In retrospect, how many of those people that thought he was arrogant after they saw his entire career would still say that? That's something I'm really interested in. And what is the difference between confidence and arrogance? I think that there's a pretty fine line, but a pretty clear line between being overconfident or being arrogant. So to me, confidence is full belief in yourself, but also belief that you can get better and that you're open to feedback. Arrogance is that you're so confident that you don't believe anyone else can contribute to your success or can help you improve. And I think Kobe was the complete you know, he embodied confidence, but he was almost the complete off opposite of that definition of arrogance. He was so willing to listen to feedback. He was so willing to go ahead and ask people how he could get better. It wasn't just the, it wasn't just the, the other players. It was the coaches. It was anyone he could get his hands on that he felt had valuable knowledge. Um, you know, this is a good example of Kobe's confidence. So the counselor made a point to admonish Kobe. Only one in a million make it to the NBA, the counselor said. So you have to plan on a future other than basketball. I'm going to be that one in a million, Kobe allegedly replied. After all, he explained, Magic Johnson had done it. Michael had done it. Why not me? And this is when he was 11, right? But what evidence in his life does he have that would suggest that he couldn't do this? He'd been around professional basketball players all his life. He, His dad was a former professional basketball player. He clearly had skills better than all these kids around there's no evidence or there's nothing that would tell him that he that he should doubt what his belief is. And obviously he ended up doing that. He ended up being one of the great ones. And here's an example of story that that story that we're telling. 
Yet, in Kobe's insular experience, the answer was merely routine and logical. He had been raised not to see himself as an average young player. He was well aware of his bloodlines. So growing up, he knew he had the secret weapon, which was his genetics, his family upbringing, his work ethic, all of those things combined. He saw what the professional basketball players had to go through. If he felt that he could do that and compete at that level because he saw their work ethic, he, he saw their training, he saw their skill what would prevent him from becoming an NBA player? The only thing would probably be injury or something catastrophic catastrophic happening. And to that point, his confidence is consistently validated. That's how you build confidence. You see yourself succeeding. Don Bryan said, I'm telling you, man, whenever you get a chance to play against those guys, don't be afraid, man. Just play your game. You'll be surprised. They go for all the moves that high schoolers do. So Kobe Bryant is telling his friend Donnie Carr, who is an, you know, one of his rivals in high school basketball, a good friend of his. So Kobe is playing a lot of uh, pickup with the 76ers team. He's in their gym, playing against them constantly. And the interesting thing is he's able to validate what he's been doing in high school and all these things. He's seeing that they're falling for the same things. He's maybe not dominating them the way that the high schoolers are doing, but he's able to hold his own. And this is just another feather in his cap that adds to his confidence. Yes, all the hard work that I'm putting in is validated. And he can tell one of his friends that, you know, part of getting to the NBA is the belief that you're good enough or that you're there. And he's constantly seeing this through practicing against these guys. So, you know, even when he does get bested, which does happen, he was confident enough to realize that it wasn't going to happen for long because he saw this incredible growth trajectory that he was on. Bryant was obviously unhappy at getting bested by Maxwell. So I think that was Vernon Maxwell. He didn't take it well, but you had to respect him because he was playing harder than I've ever seen him play. That's when you knew Kobe was going to be a pro. The next day, he turned around and killed Eddie Jones, who was playing for the Lakers. This was five on five, destroyed Eddie, gave Stackhouse problems. And, you know, he goes and proves to himself again that he can hang with these guys. Yes, he gets beat, but he views that as a challenge to come and compete and, and perform better. And while he had maybe a blip in that validation bubble, he comes and completely validates himself the next day. This happens again. Uh, this is also early in his NBA career when he's drafted by the Lakers, but he gets to play magic one-on-one. -on -one. He says, I remember one time we had a pick and roll and we forced him to switch out. So I had the wing. So I'm isolated with magic. I'm looking and I'm not really play, paying that much attention. I'm like, hold up. I got magic on me. I'm going to take him to the hoop. So bam, I go to the hoop and I go for a layup on one side and he tries to foul me. Another guy comes up and steps up from the baseline. So I hang and go to the other side of the, and scoop it, lay it off the glass, get an and one. He's like, yeah, man. Okay. Okay. Nice move. So this is validation from a player that he idolized and worshiped growing up. Kobe and his family, when they heard my, uh, Magic Johnson got AIDS, they were all in the car and they just all started crying. He cared for this man. And to see, to have this person validate his movement patterns or to say nice move or to get that type of accolade to him is just another, that's, that's something he can feed off of, a constant reminder that he's there and he should be there. You know, something about confidence too, is that you can laugh at yourself. I think a lot of people who are arrogant, they can't look at their downside very well. And Kobe was really good at that. He, you know, he, he was someone who could uh, make fun of himself and, and poke fun of himself. So Kobe would make fun of himself back then. Kobe could poke fun. And I always appreciated his self-deprecating aspect and his self-awareness. He knew the image that was being formed of him in the public eye, especially with some of Shaq's early shots and everything. Uh, again, I, I highly recommend watching that Kobe doing work uh, video on doc, uh, on YouTube or, or wherever you can find it. You can see how critical of himself he is, but all that criticism is aimed at making him better. And again, that it to me is the definition that separates confidence from arrogance. So after this section, I would ask you, how do you improve your confidence? What are the steps you can take? And so there's a couple different ways that I think are really interesting that, that I read about, again, in that Genius of Athletes book, actually. First is if you look back at your track record. So you look at all of your performance to date, whether it was in, in school, you, you know, you're questioning if you're smart enough to, to make it somewhere where you can say, okay, in, in school, I, I, I did these things, I overcame these obstacles. 
or in your sports performance. Okay, I hit the shot when it mattered. I was able to to do this. I I practiced in practice. I hit the shot a thousand times. That is a way that you can build the confidence there. You can also visualize. You can see yourself winning the medal. You can see yourself hitting the game winning shot. You can see yourself in these scenarios. And if you do that over and over again, when you're in that scenario, you'll have the confidence because you've seen it so many times. Another thing that was interesting to me that I didn't really understand at first was you can look at other people's track records. So I can gain confidence by watching a mashup on YouTube of Tiger Woods hitting all of his best shots ever. I get to feed off of that. Part of that sort of blends into my psyche of seeing that greatness. If you see it enough times, it sort of blends into what you believe you can do. And then finally, there's absolutely no substitute for hard work. I think Kobe Bryant would be the first to tell you that. And if you know you've hit a shot or you know you've done a movement thousands and thousands of times, it just becomes routine over that period of time. You have confidence you can do it because it is habit. <clears throat> this next part is called the challenger. So something I love about Kobe Bryant is that he framed every single obstacle in his life as a challenge. So there was nothing, there, there is no record that I could find of him truly being down. Every single bad thing he had to say was framed in some way as a challenge. So, you know, from Kobe, he says, someone says I can't do something and I want to go out and do it on purpose and do it in an unbelievable way. So Kobe is never intimidated by any of these types of things. He's constantly looking for a way to challenge himself and to challenge other people. When he was growing up, you know, Kobe sort of came from, well, Kobe went to Lower Marion, which was more of a middle, upper, upper middle class school. And a lot of people would heckle him because they didn't think that he was, you know, quote unquote, like street enough for basketball. But Kobe was from the suburbs. I would tell people this all the time. He never acted like a suburban kid. He always acted like an inner city kid. And it wasn't synced or faked. He always had Philadelphia toughness and this mentality like he would never back down. He loved challenges. Like if you started talking to him, he would really get locked in and focused. And you could just see the determination in his face. And he would just start playing even harder. It seems that, you know, it wasn't, it was kind of his upbringing and his experience that built in that challenging nature. It wasn't unique to where he went to school or if he was from the suburbs or not. He loved these challenges. And that's what one of the things that made him great. I mean, you, you hear all these stories about any professional athlete, how competitive they are. This was clearly a part of Kobe's DNA. It, you know, to that point, every adversity that he faced in his career, he framed as a, a challenge even if it's something mundane like homework. So in high school, this is something that he, he talks about. Getting after school tutoring for geometry class wasn't a chore, but a challenge. Egan asked him how it was going. Good, really good, Kobe told him. This shit is fun. Scoring uh, 1,080 on his SATs was to him not a benchmark that combined his athletic prowess would gain him entrance to Duke or Notre Dame or any other Ivy League caliber university. It was a reflection instead of who he was what he might yet do. He could go to any college he chose and he would thrive there, but he didn't have to go. So even the SATs he's viewing as a challenge, which to me is pretty funny, but that is the approach that most of these great athletes have. Their willingness to, to be creative and push forward and do all this stuff, it stems from viewing all of these scenarios, any adversity, any challenges as a competition or or something that they can overcome. You, know, you think a lot of kids, athletes now, they don't enjoy school, which is fine. I, I don't think everyone enjoys school. It's not relevant to everyone. But what if you viewed it like a challenge in the way that Kobe Bryant is? What if you're viewing it as an, an opportunity to go to whatever college you want and not have to worry about it? It's something to brag about with your peers. I mean, that that's kind of fun as well. Kobe had this unbelievable skill of showing strength in his lowest points. And this is something that I have a lot of quotes on because I, I thought it was so fascinating. We're going to go through his life here and talk about some of the experiences associated with that. The kid with the knee pads spent a lot of time creating challenges for himself. He would just look for anything that would motivate and challenge him. He had the same mentality when he was a young boy that people would talk about later. He was always just trying to find something that would fuel the fire and have him playing with that edge. He had a lot in his game back then when he was heading into the ninth grade. So 
early in his life, he is constantly looking for these challenges. And this challenging mindset, I think, is something that gave him incredible motivation to practice, to put in all this hard work. If you're viewing everything like a challenge, like you have an opponent, like there's adversity, it's a really easy to get motivation to put a lot of effort into that. One of the lowest points in his entire career came in, in the summer where his first summer in the Sunny Hill League. And I, I want to read a quote about this. So some of his fondest memories came from playing in the Sunny Hill League. And he noted that the summer hill that the summer of 92 was the one he treasured the most. He couldn't possibly have felt that way at the time. In 25 games, playing up a level against players who were a year or two older than he was, he did not score a point. Not a meaningless layup in a blowout, not a wing and prayer jumper, nothing. He had shamed his father and his uncle, and he briefly considered giving up on basketball and focusing on soccer. A natural and, and easy transition, given that he was living in Europe. But instead, he rededicated himself, learning of the half-true story of Michael Jordan getting cut from his high school team. In reality, Jordan was merely assigned to the junior varsity squad, and using this common ground with the sport's greatest player to inspire him. Humiliation became motivation, and motivation became obsession. It was a turning point for me, Kobe said. It really was. Zero points the whole summer, and that became a big motivating thing for me. To make sure when I came back to the Sunny Hill League, I was ready to play. I was ready to compete. So he takes probably the lowest point in his career because to that point and every team he was ever on, he was leading, he was dominating, to be kicked down to score zero points for a whole summer. That to me is the epitome of overcoming adversity at that point in time. He was able to look at that and yes, he considered quitting, but that didn't come from his mouth. That came from a, from a, one of the writers. So it might not have been true. I, I don't think he ever considered quitting basketball. But the idea that he could frame this as a positive to be something that pushed him and motivated him, that he could file away in this cabinet that he could reach for whenever he needed that extra motivation is something that's really powerful. And again, when he gets to the NBA, there's a lot of conversation around this. And there was Kobe asked about the perils of playing professional basketball as a teenager saying, this is the ultimate challenge. You get a chance to learn from the best. If they're killing you, if they're beating you up, they're teaching you at the same time. Only positives can come from it. That to me is a really great philosophy. Harder to exemplify <laughs> than it is to say, right? It's pretty easy to get beat down if you, you know, very much like he was in the summer, uh, the Sunny Hill League. But with that philosophy going into the league, how could he not improve at an unbelievable play pace? If we all had that same philosophy that when we're playing, when we're losing and any of these things, it's the best learning experience we can have because when we lose, we learn. Uh, yeah, how can you not get better? Uh, we, we touched a little bit about earlier when he was sitting on the bench, but here's another example of that in his first year in, on the, in the league. One of the hardest things this year was not knowing whether you're going to play or how many minutes you're going to play. By, but at the same time, that kind of helps you because you just have to be ready every night. So he's unbelievably disappointed and he's vocal about being disappointed that he's sitting, but he's still turning this into a lesson, turning this into a challenge, turning this into an opportunity. Um, well, probably the the lowest point uh, in his career after, you know, probably maybe even more so than the, than the Sunny Hill League getting shut out for the summer was in his first year in the NBA in, 19, in 1997, when they're in the playoffs and he shoots four air balls in against the Utah Jazz. And it's it's a very interesting approach because he says, it was an early turning point for me in being able to deal with adversity, deal with public scrutiny and self-doubt. So, you know, this is probably one of the most disappointing points ever. He was the one that wanted to take these shots. He missed all of them, but he still realized that, that this, the, the bigger the failure, the bigger the lesson for him. Uh, there's a couple other ones that I want to point out. Um, his first big slump in the NBA came, I believe it was in 1998 or 1999. And I, I just love his philosophy on this. This is the toughest stretch I've ever gone through, he said at the time. I'm hating it, but I'm loving it. It's part of the challenge. It's part of the fun. Am I pressing? Maybe. That's something I have to think about. I want to go through periods when I'm struggling because that's when you learn. And the more you learn, the better you get. So he's viewing this career slump when it's in the middle of the season, not in the playoffs, as an opportunity to learn. What is it like to be in a slump? How do you get out of a slump? That's probably a more important skill 
than a lot of the other things that, that he could learn at the time. If he figures out how to get out of slumps, he'll have less and less slumps in the future or they'll be shorter and shorter over time. And then at the end of the, his career, you start to see his, you know, when he injures his Achilles, which is probably the most tragic injury that, that he had in the course of his career, his philosophy on that. And this is when he's getting older, when there might not be as much fuel left in the tank. Before the Achilles injury, I was thinking about my career arc. I would feel my body wearing out and I knew I was on the clock. When the Achilles injury happened, I treated it as a new challenge. People were saying I might not be able to come back, but I knew I was not going to let it beat me. I was not going to let an injury dictate my retirement. I was going to dictate my retirement. That's when I decided I had to climb that mountain. There's so many examples of of him challenging himself. I, I just really love that <clears throat> that um, that he is able to exemplify it in this way. There is really good science actually backing self talk. So there's a a study of cyclists, and they put them in control groups where some of the cyclists were using. Uh, challenging self-talk and other, you know, obviously there was a control group and the cyclists who were talking to themselves and challenging themselves incrementally, they pedaled significantly further than the other cyclists. So we have research that suggests that this actually works, which is pretty cool. Uh, the, you know, there's, oh, this is a pretty long section, but I think for a good reason. So it wasn't just that he created these challenges. He actually welcomed haters. He welcomed people to criticize him because that added fuel to his fire. So we talked a little bit about a guidance counselor that essentially told him to give up on his NBA dream because it was one in a million. And Kobe has a really good take on this. He says, I thought, if this is hard to accomplish, how in the world am I going to accomplish it if I don't put all my eggs in one basket? If I don't focus 100% on this, I'm never going to get there. So he obviously proves that guidance counselor wrong, but it also reminds me of a quote by Andrew Carnegie. So Andrew Carnegie is known for Carnegie Steel, probably one of the most successful entrepreneurs ever. A lot of people talk about diversification and, you know, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, but Andrew Carnegie believes, and basically all the richest people ever of all time also share this philosophy, is you should put all your eggs in one basket and watch that basket carefully. You know, in high school, Kobe would get heckled a lot. There'd be a lot of people that would make fun of him uh, for essentially coming up and growing up in the suburbs. And he would create just a pressure cooker for himself when he was practicing to get used to this adversity. So, and it meant having Gilbert, while Kobe was shooting and driving and refining his footwork, mimic the insults that Kobe had heard either to his face or behind his back. You're good, but you don't play in the public league, dribble, dribble. You live in the suburbs, spin. You go to a white school, swish. There's no competition there. Hard dribble, hard dribble. You're not one of us, dunk. He would use these things. He would leverage these things into motivation, into practice, into all of this. It, the, the more criticism he got, the more fuel he could add to his fire. And that's, you know, being able to turn that negative energy into fuel is such a powerful force. Um, you know, you obviously saw this with Tiger Woods. His dad would shout racial slurs at him. His dad would berate him, jiggle keys. And that was a game that him and his dad played. It's kind of maybe like a little sadistic game, but it was something that cultivated one of the most motivated practicers and one of the hardest mindsets ever in professional sports. Even being drafted when he, when he went into the NBA, he actually didn't want to be drafted first, which is very weird. Everyone wants to be drafted first, but this is what he says. And if Kobe were the first player selected, there'd be no team against whom he could hold a grudge. The number one pick, pick isn't passed over. The number one isn't explicitly underestimated by any of the league's other teams because none of them had the opportunity to draft him. The number one pick can't prove anyone wrong. I want people to say, oh, you messed up because you, didn't, you did not take him. He said not long after the draft. That was what I want. Um, you know, the, the, again, there's some of these other examples. I'm just going to read through them. First, he would never forget any of this criticism. He would ingest it all, tell everyone that none of that criticism bothered him, when in fact, every slight, every doubt, every reservation about his future infiltrated his being like a germ and burned in his brain like a fever. Chester, Utah, the draft, Del Harris, he would read everything he always read. And again, he had this insane ability to turn that reading, that negative energy, that criticism into fuel for his fire. 
he, he saw this on the court as well. So when he first got in the league, Allen Iverson was playing more than he was, getting more minutes, getting all these things. And Kobe wanted that. And he was also able to turn this into that practice, that like manic, crazy energy for him to, to drill and work hard. All Kobe saw, saw were shackles. All Kobe saw was Allen Iverson playing 40 minutes and scoring 23, 24 points a night for the Sixers. Kerry Kittles playing 36 minutes and scoring 16 to 17 points a night for John uh, Calipari and the Nets. And a coach in Los Angeles who was holding him back and burying him on the bench out of spite. So it wasn't all positive. You know, he didn't create the best relationship with his coaches and those types of things. But it was still fuel for his fire. Yeah, I mean, th this is the quote. I probably should have read earlier, but I really like this one. Kobe didn't care. He wanted people to doubt him. I didn't want to come in like Shaquille O'Neal, maybe Chris Weber, who had all these expectations running on them. Even if they're performing great, it's still not good enough because it's never going to meet the expectations that the people put on them. I just want to ease in, sneak up on people. The next thing people will be saying is, wow, he's doing great. And then, you know, something I see in a lot of athletes that I study is they have this insane memory. And I wonder if it's from constant visualization. Where does this come from? But, you know, in Kobe's case, well, one of the major differences between them and Kobe is that Kobe did hold grudges and Kobe remembered everything. Every slight, every sideways remark, Kobe wouldn't let it go. I've always said this. If it's very, very hard to gain his trust, it's very easy to lose it. And if you do, good luck on getting it back. The, the memory thing is fascinating. You can you can ask Kobe about a shot that he hit, or you could have asked Kobe about a, any, a shot that he hit in any game. He would remember. He'd remember it. He'd remember where the players were. You ask Tiger about any shot that he hit in a tournament, and he could tell you what the wind direction was. I, I think that maybe that's something you develop by visualization and practice and, and using those shots and being able to call them up over time. But that's something I really want to dive into. I want to ask someone a bit more about visualization and interview them around that process and the, the tie to memory. Uh, in, in Kobe Bryant's Muse, which is another really good documentary, he talks a little bit about how he uses the darkness or the darker emotions to fuel him. So pain, abandonment, and loneliness. And I think that that's something he, he got from his mom that he describes later. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the mom mentality section. Um, the, the last part I want to talk about related to criticism is a, a story I heard about him and Michael Jordan. So when Kobe was playing Michael and Michael was at the Wizards, Michael sort of lit him up and the Wizards beat the Lakers in the first game they played against each other. And Michael scored quite a few points against Kobe Bryant. And so at the time, Kobe was wearing, I think it was Jordan 8s. And Michael slaps him on the butt after the game and says, hey, you can wear the shoes, but you'll never fill them. And that made Kobe go completely insane. He didn't talk to his team for two weeks. He was so pissed. He just practiced like he'd never practiced before. He was on a mission. And then the next time they play the Wizards, I think it was two weeks later, he absolutely lit up Michael Jordan. He completely torched him. And that that is the tank. That is the the power that Kobe could draw out from this criticism or this adversity. And you know, maybe that's not something I don't think I have that gear, but maybe we can develop some of that gear as well. Um, and he, you know, I, I touched on this a little bit before, but he pulls incredible positives out of bad performance. So one of the low points in his career that I loosely described earlier was when he missed those four shots against the Utah Jazz. Um, and this is his sort of approach. And so one of his uh, mentors says, who's Sonny Vaccaro, he says, you miss the shots. I'm just saying quickly. And Kobe says, well, nobody else wanted to shoot the ball. <laughs> and to me, that that's a really good approach is that in that terrible moment where he missed these shots, he realized that he was the only one that had the stones to go up and take them. And if we take that away from it is he's pulling a benefit. He's pulling the positives out of this. He sort of took it in a three-step process, though. So he saw it for what it was. It sucked. He saw what he could learn about it, and then he pulled what the positives were about uh, out of that were. And, you know, that's something he can take forever is if you're the only one, to one that wants to shoot him, you're better off shooting him and missing him than not shooting him at all. It, it, the same thing his friend Donnie Carr says, that's the Kobe I know. He misses 10 straight shots, but he still can't wait to take the next one. It was like never going back. He's never going to back down or be afraid of the challenge. 
Early in the first week, he would have to view his airball sequence again. He laughed at it. The only thing that would have hurt, he later told the reporter, was if he had chickened out and passed the ball, if he had not taken that pressure on himself. I wanted those shots. I just didn't make them. If I had to do it over again, put me in the same scenario, I'd take the shots again. I'd have no problem with that, regardless of what anybody says. So this ability to see the value, the benefit, understanding how you're gaining experience even from these bad scenarios is a reframe that we can all make. And then finally, for Kobe, there was no such thing as failure. So there's no fear against going against good players. He was just going against them. By playing against the best, you're assuming, you're, you're taking on the risk of being embarrassed or things not going as you would have expected. That is the expectation of playing against greatness. You have to realize that on a nightly basis, a guy can come out and kill you, he said. You have to prepare yourself, and I know I'm going to prepare myself. If a guy comes out and kills me, I'm not just going to sit back and let him. I'm going to do everything I can to stop him. And if he does light me up, I'm going to have to look at the videotape and see what he did to beat me. Next time I play him, I'm going to know every move. When he touches his nose, when he touches his ear, I'm going to know everything. So he's totally fine with getting lit up. He's getting beat. That's a way for him to grow. And, you know, when we turn this on ourselves, how do we learn from our experiences from the adversity we fail? I mean, a lot of professional athletes, they sort of have this uh, time box or this approach where after it happens, they can be mad about it. And then they have to forget about it because they have to go and perform and play. And maybe that's an approach that we can take for our own lives is we are upset about it quickly. We get over it so we can continue to compete. And then we, when we evaluate it again, we look at it objectively and say, why did this happen? What could we do better? What could we learn from it? All right. It took a little while. We're, we're getting closer to the end. We only have two sections left, but this is probably my entire section, my, my favorite section of this entire series. It's called Kobe the Hero. So I believe that this is one of the single things that separates Kobe from other, other athletes, what makes him great uh, compared to anyone else. And it is what I also believe to be the secret behind his ability to mo self-motivate and really get the most out of any scenario. And it's related directly to his imagination and his creativity. So the reason that I believe he can practice so hard is based on his visualization and the ability for him to put himself in his own narrative, for him to be able to create a story for his himself, an arc where he is the hero. And because he is the hero, he has this unbelievable mission that he has to go on that he must complete or else. So th this started to take form when he was a kid, playing against his, the greats, you know, shooting socks into a trash can, but it really developed and cultivated when he was in high school from his English teacher, Miss Mastriano. So if most of Kobe's courses were obligations to him, Mastriano's was an escape. As it turned out, an essential one. She centered much of her course material around the concept of the hero's journey, showing Star Wars in class to her students. In Luke Skywalker, an easily accessible case study before drawing on Greek mythology and the writings of Joseph Campbell, particularly his seminal work, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. It's a book I read. This is a book actually a professional athlete recommended that I read about storytelling and understanding the hero's journey. It was obvious to Mastriano that Kobe, even at 15, saw himself on the, that trajectory. The course material was a drug in his veins, feeding the grand vision he had of himself and his future. He read the Iliad and asked himself, do I identify with the rage-driven Achilles or the honor-bound Hector? So he is, you know, I'm getting goosebumps because he is putting himself in these stories. He is seeing these heroes and how they motivate and the, the grand mission they're on as his own. And in his grand mission was obviously playing basketball, being the greatest of all time. But if your entire life is a story and you're the hero in it, you don't do things that aren't aligned with that story. You're able to create this incredible vision that pushes him towards the future that he wants. So his imagination and the storytelling, it, it started as a young age, at a young age, but the way he used it as a kid and the way he used it as an adult was really cool. He's able to sort of time travel. And I think that this is one of the coolest skills that we can all develop. So when he was a kid, he's shooting tube socks and flicking them into a garbage can. He was pretending he was playing against Magic Johnson or, or any of these incredible players. 
right? He is taking himself from the present and pretending it's like in the future. You know, if you're a golfer, you're on the putting green, you're hitting three footers, you're pretending it's to win the Masters. But it works the other direction too. So late in his career, when you're in a pressure situation, when you're shooting free throws with the game on the line, you're transporting yourself back to when you were a kid, when you're just shooting in the driveway, when there's no pressure in any of these types of things. And your imagination, your creativity, whatever story arc you're on, can help transport you to those scenarios. Being able to time travel like that is a skill that a lot of professional athletes have and they cultivate. As he's growing up, though, you get to see how this plays into his life very specifically. So for the next six years, Brian had lived his life as if on a mythical quest. The only way he could keep the whole dream going was to work harder and harder and harder, to spin his fantasies around and around until they wrapped him tight in a new reality. Visualization was immense for that. It drove his many hours of solitary practice time. In America, as in Italy, he took to playing entire games alone on the court in his own personal practice right before he played them for real in front of audiences. Perhaps no other player has ever made more use of his imagination. I mean, think about that. He's playing entire games. He is creating this own reality that he can't help but bring to the, to the real world. I drive myself, Brian confided, saying that work was more important than play. I'd like to go out and have fun, have a good time, but I just, it just don't feel right. While I'm out having a good time, I could be playing basketball or something. I could be lifting weights. I could be working towards something. So if all of these other things aren't part of this, this mystical story, this quest that he's on, why would he pursue them? You know, if me, for me, watching Netflix isn't going to add to whatever journey that make me being an a excellent podcaster, having, a, having a, a future in content that I would like, I can't justify them doing them to myself. And, you know, again, me comparing creating a podcast to Kobe Bryant's career, probably not a very fair comparison, but uh, it, it still is relatable to all of us. Bryant was the guy who had always invited history, even as a kid. He was going to be the greatest, and suddenly this game was the full combination of all of his ambition. As he goes forward, each step of his career, you just constantly see him relating his experiences, his life, to a grand story, this grand vision. Even when he meets Tex Winner, who was a major mentor for him, as we talked about in the, in the previous part, you get to see how he immediately weaves him into the story. So Tex Winner showed up to help coach the Lakers. Bryant immediately dubbed him his Yoda. He had this very symbolic, metaphorical way of seeing things, observed George Mumford, the psychologist and competitive specialist who became one of Bryant's mentors. Bryant was a writer too, a poet. So he viewed the world through the lens of a fabulous narrative. His favorite book as a senior in high school had been the sci-fi fantasy Ender's Game about a protagonist trained from a young age to face increasingly difficult challenges in order to save the world. So think about the plot of Ender's Game and Kobe's approach to training, his philosophy. If Ender's Game is his favorite book and he's dedicating all this time to practice and overcoming these increasingly difficult challenges, he's viewing him as the character. It's pretty easy to practice if you feel like you're in a game, if you feel like you're in a movie, if you feel like it was destined to be. And he was maybe the best of all time at leveraging this imagination into increased practice hours and into making his practice as fun as possible. So after Kobe has, um, has retired from basketball, he started writing these children's books. And all these children's books are focused on sports and for for young kids how to make practice fun so for example the tennis ball machine is a fire breathing dragon and and as a kid you're you're defending whatever it is and he is able to tell these stories to kids that i would expect from how he was viewing the world to me those are a really cool glimpse into how he was using his imagination to facilitate his practices make it so that they were not tiring they were energizing for him to be on this incredible journey uh, one place that this hero's journey and this experience showed up the most was in his injuries. So when he would get injured, overcoming adversity in those is something all heroes do. I mean, in every hero journey, they face adversity and conflict and they overcome that and they become better. That is the arc of every single story. And that's also how he viewed his things. He also has this quote that I love about how he describes injury. 
Brian said of the many injuries in pro basketball, if the moment is bigger than the injury, you don't feel pain. So he was able to put the moment to say, this is more important. This is bigger than me. This is bigger than just my injury. And he was able to essentially forget about the injury in, in those moments. You, you think of the Achilles when he, he, he made the two free throws after he tore his Achilles and walked off the court. Um, you think about in high school when, oh, this is one, a, a really good story, before he, uh, before the championship game that, was, that would be the first championship that they would win in high school uh, in a very long period of time, one of the smaller guys on the team broke his nose. And Kobe, in typical Kobe fashion, just shook it off and completely amped the team up in this way. So he breaks his nose, he's bleeding all over the place, and he goes, ball, he said. Someone threw him a soft bounce pass. He caught the ball with his left hand, five feet behind the three-point arc. He turned to Tretman, who was standing next to him, who's a coach. Jeremy, I'll bet you $5 I can make this three-point shot with my left hand. I bet you I can make this shot. Tretman took the bet, one-handed, off-handed, Kobe lofted the ball towards the basket, swish. Right, this is part of his journey. That That is like a absurd thing to do right after you break your nose when you have the championship game on the line. A lot of people would be sweating, stressing. No, this is all part of his story. That's what makes it even better. Um, and then finally, I, I touched on a little bit with the Achilles, but this is a, a quote related to that. The fact that he went back out on the floor with a torn Achilles and walked, walked up there and sank two foul shots and walked off, I mean, most people would have to be carted away in an ambulance. But, you know, he walked up there and made the two foul shots. I mean, the guy was unbelievable. I mean, how do you think he was able to do that? Because he wasn't living in the real world. He was living in this fantasy world where he had to make those shots. It was obvious he was going to make those shots. That's what the moment called for. And this quote, I think, really sums up Kobe's philosophy around hard work and how this ties into the imagination as well. Just another part of the romance. He'd always been happy to let you know that he reveled in the work. It had always been his particular mind game, that he was going to outwork you and that there was nothing you could do about it because you couldn't possibly outwork him. Now he turned that mind game on himself. Where doubt would have consumed most elite athletes at his age, his belief ballooned. That had always been his behemoth, belief. Now it expanded to dirigible size, blocking out the light as he healed and lost himself in the gym. And this is, you know, part of that narrative arc where he comes back from this Achilles injury at a late stage in his career when most people would just retire. To me, that is, uh, you know, artful in the way that he is able to use this tool that, you know, most other professional athletes have not cultivated this imagination and and build it into something incredible. Um, how, how do you how do, how do we get a better imagination? How do we incorporate some of these types of things? We could probably read some books. I mean, Here with a Thousand Faces is a little bit dense, e even for me, but you could have ChatGPT summarize it. You could understand what makes a good narrative. You could write down what you want your story to be, what your adversity was, what you have to overcome, and try to figure out how that bleeds into a future that you would want in whatever you're pursuing, whether it's sports, whether it's your professional life. I, I think that there's a lot of value in writing down what you would like your story to be or what your story has been to this point. So there's really only one more section and then like a tiny thing on leadership that I have. Uh, but this is probably what everyone's waiting, waiting for. This is the section on the mama mentality. So what is the mama mentality? The alter ego to showboat which would be the nickname Black Mamba that Bryant created for himself to counter public disapproval in the wake of his sexual assault charges. Bryant had seized upon, sized upon the killer snake in Quentin Tarantino films as the perfect embodiment of his supposedly similarly remorseless competitive nature. So at the most basic level, the Black Mamba, from, from what I'm reading, was his ability and his his alter ego that he used to compartmentalize what was going on on the basketball court and off the basketball court. So during the time that he created this, he had a rocky relationship, not only with his family, but with his wife. Uh, well, so it's like parents and stuff, but also his wife after being accused of sexual assault. Um, there was so much going on, but his play did not suffer at all. He had this ability to compartmentalize like very few other people. Usually things bleed together. And I find this really interesting because, you know, in George Mumford's book, he talks about how 
as athletes, we have to be, you know, we can't compartmentalize. We have to be complete and we have to be Zen the whole time. And Kobe sort of said, no, I can compartmentalize this and this and basketball is sort of my safe place. This aspect of the mama mentality existed even when he was a kid. Growing up, he could constantly compartmentalize very well, but I think naming it gave it additional power over time. So let's look at some examples of how he was able to compartmentalize at a young age. He was always trying to get better to the point that he'd cut everything and everyone off. It was just he had a vision. He had a goal in mind, and that was it. That was the end all be all. He played like every game was his last. Every workout was going to be his last. He would outwill people, man. His will was just unmatched. So he, he had this ability to cut off people, to cut off things, cut off even really enticing stuff that he wanted to do in favor of his long-term goals. Somehow, Kobe Bryant managed to turn all the pent-up emotion wrought by his family's hidden uh, disintegration into an exceptional emergence in the 2001 NBA playoffs. What's more, he did it on a day's notice. That had hardly seemed possible based on both his team's and family's tremendous conflict and turmoil that season. But Bryant had quietly found strength from the practice of mindfulness and Tai Chi that George Mumford had taught. So at the time, Kobe and his family are creating a massive rift. So he marries his wife, Vanessa. They don't get a prenup and his family does not approve. And over that period of time, he just more and more stops talking to his family, basically. Um, and then there's the sexual assault uh, charges that happen, I believe, a little bit later. And that's even more of a rift. He's completely isolated. But his performance on the basketball court never changes. I'm not advocating for any of these things, but I think the ability to compartmentalize is something that is very powerful and something we should be able to strengthen and work on. So Kobe was sitting down by himself, Beck recalled. I was the first one to walk over there. Like he's just sitting there silent, looking down at the floor. The moment he had fixated upon for days was now past. And the emotion of all the events came rolling in at once. A great tide of recognition. His sadness over his grandfather, his joy at marriage, his mixed feeling over his family, his happiness at how the team had played, his defiance against all those people in his hometown who had been against him from his earliest days. So I forgot his grandfather also died during that period. Um, but this is essentially, you know, his compartmentalization after he wins this NBA championship, he can let it all out. But he's able to create this firm wall in his brain that parses out those all of the stuff that's happening off the court and all the stuff that's happening on the court. And this is a skill, I think, that has helped him unbelievably. Imagine if you know, we break up with our girlfriend, if things don't go well, and that doesn't affect what we do on the court. How, how do we cultivate that over time? He did a great job separating personal stuff with his ability to compartmentalize those things. I never saw that manifest itself in any way any different way at all in his approach to work during any of his personal tribulations that he had. I never saw him bring that to work. So this is a quote from someone during his the sexual assault scandal. That that to me is is something that again underlies what the mama mentality is, but it gets significantly more uh structured and add and has a lot more power when he names it specifically the black mamba. So what is the black mamba? So the black mamba, in my opinion, is a offshoot of what's known as the alter ego effect. So when we create an alter ego for ourselves, we can embody that person. We can. It's almost even an offshoot of split personality disorder, where when we describe ourselves as that, we can do all of the actions of that, but it's still not ourselves, and we can become that in certain scenarios, whether it's on the course or, or on stage or anything like that. So there's two other really good examples of this. I don't think I described it probably as well as I could have, but uh, if you're familiar with David Goggins, so David Goggins is you know, quote unquote, the hardest man on the planet. He runs all these ultra marathons. He is known for at one point in time, breaking the pull-up world record. And he has an alter ego, which is Goggins. So David Goggins, he believes, is this soft guy who, who isn't willing to go to the dark places and grind out anything that he needs to do, especially in these, in these ultra marathons. And Goggins is who he calls upon to push through the hard stuff. Goggins is the person who set that world record. Goggins is the one that finishes these ultra marathons. Uh, Beyonce also had a alter ego. So she had 
pretty bad stage fright when she was coming up. And she created this alter ego of Sasha Fierce to be able to go on stage and perform to the best of her ability. And so Kobe Bryant has created this Black Mamba alter ego to go in and really present his best basketball on the court. So when he turns that on, he is just a basketball player. That is the sole focus of that alter ego. And, you know, Kobe describes himself that, hey, the pressure is there, but when you when you embody that, you don't necessarily feel it. So the pressure is there, the pressure is there, Brian acknowledged, but it's how you deal with it. When you feel it, it's how you deal with it. You just give it your best. You prepare yourself as well as you can. You might go out there and execute as well as you can. Then you sleep at night. That's all. Then you get up the next day to do the same thing. You keep it simple. Keeping it simple, you know, creating another effectively personality or character and alter ego is the single simplest way that you can parse out your life from your performance on the court. That is the ultimate simplification, in my opinion. You have this bucket and you have this bucket. You turn on the Black Mamba bucket when you're on the court and you turn on the personal bucket when you're off the court. But it is an act of simplification. As a part of his transformation from his showboat era, Brian had started calling himself the Black Mamba based on his infatuation with Quentin, the Quentin Tarantino film. To complete the makeover, he also switched jersey numbers going from number eight to number 24, saying he did it because it was a new chapter in his career. So it's not just a mental switch that we can make. We can make physical switches as well that can transform how we act or who we are. So a, a, a change of a number is a symbolic change that we can make. Something that I love doing, a lot of people do, is they change their environment. So you move your office into a new room and you take on those new behaviors. You move to a new city and, you know, I'm, I'm about to, to move to a new city in Austin. And when I move, I can take everything I like from who I am now. And in this new scenario, I can bring that with me, but I can leave everything that I don't like about myself in that previous location. This geographical shift allows me to bring and create this new personality wherever I go. So this is a very common phenomenon. We just often aren't keyed in to how powerful it is and how we can leverage it. Bryant knew it was time to draw a bit of his mother's dark side, a concept he would eventually articulate as embracing the villain within himself in order to vanquish opponents. So we talked a little bit about this before, but he is able to leverage these dark side, you know, these dark side moments, the the pain, the the adversity, the betrayal, all of this stuff in his life and create a very powerful force. And the Black Mamba is something where he feels comfortable doing that. He is the Black Mamba. He can draw on this kind of evil energy and inject it into the game without it necessarily affecting him off the court. And being able to do that and parse that out is probably an art. I don't think any of us are happy if we're constantly thinking about how we're slighted and leveraging that into energy, but creating an alter ego that is able to do that and then having our individual selves, who's a family person or whatever it might be, might be the healthiest way to, to, to get the best of both worlds. Um, you know, something that in the Mamba, when he is the Black Mamba he's able to do is he's either to get able to get into flow or into the zone at, at a level that we really hadn't seen before in his career. Obviously, he could do it a lot when he was growing up, probably happened even more when he was working on mindfulness stuff with George Mumford. But he was able to tap into something, which is another force that I wanted to talk on because it was new to me. So a flow state is effortless excellence. It's known as being in the zone. When you're challenged at the right way, your skill is matching that challenge, and you're getting immediate feedback. It, it is effortless. It is high energy state. There's another state that I read about from Christian Swan, who, who's, a, who's a researcher in the space called Clutch. And in Clutch, you have very fixed performance goals, and it's a conscious effort to reach a target. It's essentially where you're willing the zone to happen. And Kobe and I think Tiger Woods are also people that could make the zone happen in time. The downside of this is that it is emotionally draining. It is physically draining. It is a very active conscious state. And so I want to get more information about the Clutch state. But I feel like Kobe was able to access this clutch state in when he was the Black Mamba more than than pretty much any other player aside from maybe Michael Jordan. To me, that is really impressive. You think about his final game where he put up you know, 60 plus points. Um, you know, he willed that to happen. It wasn't a flow state. He he was going to make that happen regardless of anything. Uh, the last section here is called Kobe the leader. So there's been a lot of criticism of his leadership style 
uh, and his ability to lead throughout his entire career. He came off as a selfish player. He wanted to get playing time. He wanted to be out there. He had unrealistic goals of his opponents. But I personally believe that he just was not set up with teams that were amenable to his leadership style. Um, you know, you, you mostly hear about this dysfunction, that it wasn't effective. But again, I believe that it just wasn't the, the right style of leadership. There, there's plenty of examples, in my opinion, that show that he was quite a good leader. So in high school, he was unanimously named team captain Well, by the, by the coaches, and even the seniors were not. This was when he was a junior. And Kobe went up, and he brought the seniors with him to, to the meetings before the game. He saw that that was something important to them that would help his team win, and he brought those people in. Right. That to me is not something that a completely selfish person does. It was on his own that he went and did that. He also didn't tell his teammates that he was going to the draft or, or announce publicly that he was going to the NBA draft while they were in the, the last series that they were playing in, in in high school basketball. He thought that would be a distraction. He thought that would take away from the win. So he kept that private specifically for them. Uh, and later in his career, he did win two NBA championships as a team leader. You know, maybe all that he needed was the right team where he actually was the leader rather than being on a team where, for example, Shaq was the leader and he had to play around Shaq's ego and some of these other things. Um, you know, you're, you're probably only as good as the buy-in that people get into your leadership style. And it seemed like as his career progressed, he was able to, to have a team around him that would buy into him being the sole leader himself. All right, well, that's it for this part two of the Kobe series on the Exponential Athlete podcast. Again, in this episode, we covered Kobe's views on adaptability, his ability to think strategically over time, his approach to confidence versus what many people perceived as arrogance. So again, the difference between confidence and arrogance is that with confidence, you're still open to feedback and you're able to integrate that into your game. With arrogance, you're too proud of yourself. You're too proud to consider that other people might be able to give you feed that back that might make you better. Better. Kobe also uh, was a challenger, which we talked about a lot. So Kobe viewed everything as a challenge. He viewed criticism as a challenge. He was able to spin every adversity that he had into something positive over time. He also had this really unique way of using his imagination where he envisioned himself as the hero in his own journey. And that's something that added so much fuel to the fire for his practice, as well as the lifestyle that he lived. And then finally, we touched on the mom mentality, how that's an offshoot of the alter ego effect. And that compartmentalization is a really powerful tool to separate yourself in your sport from what's going on off the court or off the field. And then the very last part is talking about his approach to leadership where I believe he really was trying to be a good leader and he could be a good leader if he was in the right setting, where he was able to push people to lead by example. And a lot of the time, he just wasn't in that position to be able to lead in a style that was effective for him. Now, in the next part, part three of this Kobe series, we're going to talk and focus specifically on outside factors that made Kobe great. So things that maybe he doesn't have control over, like his genetics or his upbringing, but that definitely contributed to his success. And we're also going to focus on some of the pitfalls of his approach. So what, uh, you know, what was the downside of the approach that he took working so hard? Was it injury? Was it isolation? What were these things? Again, I want to thank you for tuning in to this part two of this series. You know, a lot of research has gone into this and it makes me really happy that people are willing to, you know, listen and hopefully learn from what I'm putting together here. It, the best way to help me to help spread this is just to share this with someone who you, who you think might find it useful. That by far is the best way to contribute to the podcast in any way. And you can also leave a review or say something or give some feedback around the podcast on any of the main podcasting platforms you listen to. So again, thank you for tuning in and I will see you in the next one.